to what extent tools like ChatGPT or OpenAI can, for example, uh, replace diplomatic reporting. Diplomatic reporting is a key diplomatic activities. I'm we calculated that at least, again, half diplomats' time and international officials is dedicated to that. What will happen with that 50% of diplomats' time if suddenly Chat GPT or any other platform can do it uh, better than us? Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of the Next Page, the podcast of Library and Archive here in Geneva, dedicated entirely to advancing the conversation on multilateral links. Today, I have in the studio with me Dr. Jovan Kurbalia for a conversation on the rise of digital diplomacy. And he is one of the most renowned experts in this field in the world. Thank you, Jovan, for joining us here in Geneva in our studio. Um, well, where to start? You are the, you're a diplomat, you're a writer, a researcher, author, um, motivational speaker internationally known for your uh, competencies in digital diplomacy and a number of other disciplines and um, you created Diplo and Diplo just a few months ago in 22 celebrated celebrated 20 years of activities so in this episode we talk with you about the mission of Diplo of course and discover more about digital diplomacy, our listeners may know little or not about digital diplomacy and the impact that this has on multilateralism and international cooperation at large. So before we dive into today's content, I invite you to introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a little bit more about you and how you became interested in digital diplomacy. Thank you, Francesco. It's great to be today here for many reasons, personal, but also uh, this is a place which is one of my favorite places in Geneva, your library, and uh, not only place, place itself, but also activities which you uh, basically make uh, history, past, archives, uh, live. And this is unique, and we need more of that in Geneva. Therefore, thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to address, to discuss today with you and your uh, uh, listeners. Uh, what uh, can I say about myself? It's always difficult. I'm a person, I'm, I have a background in the diplomacy, international law and computer science. I had, uh, one can say, uh, um, uh, bad luck. I think it was a good luck to uh, have a major change in my life in the 1992. I was Yugoslav diplomat of former Yugoslavia who was sent to study in 1991 in Malta. And while I was studying, my country disappeared. It's a bad luck for diplomats, and I'm always warning my students to be careful when they go for a studies. And uh, obviously, it was a major, major uh, shock in my life, but it was also a point of uh, departure for establishing Diplo and putting together my ideas from 80s to connect diplomacy, international law, and computer science at that time, before the internet. That was the probably the most defining uh, aspect uh, related to my professional career and interest in the digital diplomacy. Later on, we established the uh, first unit for IT and diplomacy at, in Malta at the Academy, later on Diplo Foundation, and now Geneva Internet Platform. But that was probably a defining moment. So you mentioned it, Diplo, or Diplo Foundation, for those who don't, don't know. Diplo is... Um, an ensemble of uh, of products and services are present on the web. Anybody can go there. and We'll have it in the notes of this podcast so people can really go and explore. I found it very interesting, dedicated to learning, research, and advancing the discussion on, on everything digital connected to diplomacy, including governance. And we'll touch about many of those things during this chat with you. So, But I think it's fair to give to our audience a little bit of uh, overview of uh, the journey of Diplo. We said you created it. We said it's got 20 years. But um, since digital diplomacy has entered the diplomatic discourse rather recently, um, in terms of years, of course, not months, um, the concept is much older. You just said that you were, you were uh, in your early uh, years and experience as a diplomat already studying this, this thing. Um, and you're one of the earliest thought leaders in this area. So the story of Diplo 
is a little bit also the story of how digital diplomacy conversation developed over over 30 years. It starts in 1992. And can you tell our audience then a little bit how it was born and how it grew from an idea to to an institution that it is today here in Geneva, both virtually on the web for everybody, but I know it's based in Geneva. I had the pleasure to see your offices myself. So... There you go. What's the story? Francesco, the story starts with anecdotes. When I try to explain to my friends in early 90s what we have was doing, they used to invite me to fix their printer or to install the software. And that was that has been an ongoing battle to reduce confusion and to increase understanding. But basically, Diplo uh, reflects the nature of digital world, and it is very difficult to put the organization into specific pigeonhole. We teach, but we are not university. We research, but we are not think tank. We participate in policy processes, but we are not official uh, advocacy organization. That uh, involves a lot of problems when I have to do an elevator pitch, uh, what you do, <laughs> your organization do. But in the same time, it reflects the nature of digital world. You have to combine different aspects. And what we are currently doing, building on that this last 20 years of Diplo, we are currently developing concept of the organization of future, which is based around the idea of cognitive proximity between machines and humans. Therefore, that, let's say, Mediterranean uh, uh, diversity and sometimes confusion, especially when you have to fit it in institutional logic and way of thinking, is now turning into ingredients for the organization of the future, which combines teaching, learning, software development, use of AI and other tools. Very true. I, I can relate to that. It, for me, it, it, it's really true what you say. And I can see that in future we will have more of that a mix, a proximity and kind of uh, fluidity. Uh, between those that were considered boxes, watertight boxes before. Um, I know also the Diplo or Diplo Foundation uh, is more than just one entity. It includes the Geneva Internet Platform, for example, and Digital Watch. Can you help us understand you know, the geography of Diplo Foundation and these other platforms that you uh, created together with it? Sure. Uh, Diplo was established by government of Switzerland and Malta. It's uh, legally incorporated in Malta. It has uh, um, office here in Geneva and I'm based here. And it has office in Belgrade where you have technical AI and the creative development. Also our colleagues in Nairobi, Washington DC and Jakarta. Therefore there is uh, in global, especially in global south, there are new development. Geneva Internet Platform was established uh, now uh, eight years ago. Uh, as a way to help small and developing countries initially to participate in digital negotiations in international Geneva. But as soon as we started, we realized that there is a need to help all countries and international organizations and NGOs. Therefore, Geneva Internet Platform is a project of Diplo, which focuses on training, information sharing, awareness building. Today, for example, we are answering a question, what will be impact of chat GPT on the future of diplomacy? Three years ago, it was blockchain. Therefore, that's the main main function. Digital Watch is one uh, stop shop portal for anyone who would like to make sense of these growing developments in digital field from cybersecurity, data, infrastructure, AI, quantum computing. You go to dig.watch and you find authoritative, impartial and informed surveys what's going on with the background uh, information, but also with just-in-time updates about events, latest policy initiatives, uh, conventions, treaties. For example, we have now, in this week, analysis of the new AI convention, draft AI convention proposed by Council of Europe. That's the latest one. People are interested to see how to regulate AI, how to, how to govern AI. Therefore, Digital Watch serves that function. So go back to um, Diplo now. Um, I'd like to ask you, what does it do for diplomats and researchers? What is the impact of Diplo today in the world? We have now currently alumni of 7,000, more than 7,000 diplomats, officials, uh, also civil society activists, academics. And what I'm very proud, we have almost, we miss one country, we have complete uh, coverage of not only UN member state but also other territories, uh, semi-independent and other places. There is no any island state, for example, without small Diplo alumni. And uh, that was achieved, among other things, by using very early online training. In 1996, we started with the first online training. Therefore, we train diplomats, in particular small and developing countries. We do research, 
in order to spot the trends that will impact negotiations, also so all diplomatic profession, and we develop concrete tools. Currently, we are developing, for example, speech generator for artificial intelligence and the simulation tools based on AI. Those are more or less three aspects, training and teaching, uh, research and uh, development of tools. Mm, excellent. Very interesting. Um, and then all this happens, you said it before, in Malta, Geneva, in, in another number of uh, uh, places, especially in the global south. And then I would agree that there is a lot of emerging uh, trends there. But I would like to focus for a second on the importance of being in Geneva because of this positive anomaly the international Geneva is in terms of density of actors, players and people keen to participate in the multilateral Uh, dynamics. So how would you see that? How is it important for Geneva to have the Diplo Institute in Geneva as much as it is important for Diplo Institute to be in Geneva in the middle of this so special ecosystem? Well, it's it's great to be in the center of the system, but I wouldn't focus on Diplo. I would focus on the need that has to be addressed. Uh, what's happening in Geneva in digital field is on direct Uh, relevance and impact for uh, communities, citizens and countries worldwide. More than 50%, more than 50, as a matter of fact, close to 60% of policy standards that impact, for example, what we are doing now, this podcast or mobile, are uh, negotiated, discussed and managed from Geneva-based organization. Let's say standards, International Standardization Organization, International Electoral Technical Commission, International Telecommunication Union. In any field, human rights, e-commerce, you will find global and central uh, and important negotiation happening in Geneva. Therefore, without presence in this negotiation, uh, countries may lose easily uh, grasp about what is coming or influence the negotiation. Therefore, it is a central function to the large extent these days uh, performed by uh, Geneva Internet Platform, but there are other emerging actors who are also addressing this growing need to help countries, citizens, and communities and companies to shape uh, digital governance and ultimately our digital future. I want to now to, um, if, you, if, you, if you want, go a little bit deeper in digital diplomacy. We never gave yet Uh, a definition. So I would like to ask you, what is the definition you can give as an expert of digital diplomacy that could be portable for our audience so they have one to refer to? Now you're putting me in trouble because the, as always when it comes to definitions there are so many different views and this field is particularly confusing because currently you have cyber diplomacy, digital diplomacy, e-diplomacy, tech diplomacy, metaverse diplomacy. Diplomacy is attractive topic. Therefore, if somebody wants to run the project or write the paper, you just change the prefix and you basically run the new project. Now, projects are not new. Therefore, we define uh, whatever, digital cyber diplomacy, e-diplomacy, uh, around three elements. Digital diplomacy is about impact of digital te technology on geopolitical and geoeconomic environment. First, It is about new topics that diplomats address in their work in negotiations in Geneva and worldwide from cybersecurity, human rights, e-commerce. And it is about use of new tools, including social media, podcasts uh, and other practical tools, mainly for public diplomacy and engagement, but also for signaling. Therefore, digital diplomacy is impact of digital technology on geopolitical environment for diplomacy, new topics on diplomatic agenda and new tools for diplomats. Okay, that's very clear. I think I think um I think it's 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 the first time that I hear uh, a tripartite definition of digital diplomacy with such clarity so for me I'm done now I know what's digital diplomacy so let's go to the trends in digital diplomacy if we take this uh, um uh, this concept Uh, what are the new trends? And I know that you held a very important summit in November last year. In November 22, there was the Summit on Digital Diplomacy and Governance held in Malta. And that was both to celebrate, to mark the 20 years of Diplo, but essentially it was really to take stock of the past development in digital diplomacy and governance and look at the work of diplomats and policy specialists into the future. So from that summit, I imagine, emerged an image of the latest trends of where digital diplomacy is both going and leading multilateralism 
with it. And this is something that we will talk maybe later on in this podcast, but that's of great interest to our audience, where how the interaction between digital diplomacy and multilateralism of the future uh, could tell us or not something about the future of international cooperation. But going back to this important summit in November last year, what were the trends that you were able to discuss and see so that we get a better picture of where digital diplomacy is going? Following this tripartite methodology, we revisited during Malta Summit. It was established 20 years ago as a method for diplomacy work, and we identified trends around in these three sectors. In geopolitics, impact on digital technology and geopolitics, we identified that, first, digital is raising in the, if we can call it, primary league of the global politics for good or bad reasons, and you can follow it in news. From the question of access to rare materials, semiconductors, to data flows, online cables. Therefore, it has to, the digital geopolitics and geoeconomics is now on the agenda very high of diplomatic services, international organization and other places. It is not just another new tool which we may use privately. It is the core of global geopolitics. In this context, there are two trends. There is a trend towards fragmentation of the internet, quite a strong trend around uh, creating national or sometimes regional internets around, for example, data flows. And there is a serious risk that we may have fragmented internet in the next few years, more fragmented internet. And there is a push to preserve internet, integrated internet as a global uh, common good. That push comes from, from different corners, but what I call is grandma or grandpa geopolitics, interest of grandmas and grandpas worldwide to connect to their children over WhatsApp and Skype across the continent. There is a citizen's need to have more connections. Therefore, that dynamics in geopolitics will be major one, especially on the question of data and that artificial intelligence. That was the first, uh, first uh, sort of a deep discussion, how to preserve the internet as a global uh, public good and how also to address legitimate interests of countries and governments and citizens to preserve their data, access to their data. Second point in discussion was the question of new topics. What are these new topics that are emerging? And here we, the summit came to the following cl- conclusion, that in addition of uh, topics related to technology per se, let's say infrastructure standards, there is a really strong shift towards digitalization of traditional multilateral policy topics. Let's say commerce is becoming e-commerce, health is increasingly becoming digital health. And you, if you look here in Geneva around us, you have that process of digitalization of the, of the of discussion with enormous impact on the need for new skills to understand this interplay, on the need to reorganize uh, diplomatic services, uh, permanent missions, international organizations. That was the second to- uh, topic part. And third one on the new tools, the main focus was on, let's say, use of social media as existing main tool, but also emerging questions of hybrid meetings as important tool for the multilateral diplomacy. And with that changes into in the protocol, changes in the procedures. Then question of metaverse, is metaverse going to impact future of diplomacy? And third one related to artificial intelligence. To what extent... Tools like ChatGPT or OpenAI can, for example, uh, replace diplomatic reporting. Diplomatic reporting is uh, key diplomatic activities. And we calculated that at least, again, half of diplomat, diplomats' time and international officials is dedicated to that. What will happen with that 50% of diplomats' time if suddenly ChatGPT or any other platform can do it uh, better than us. And those are, let's say, issues related to uh, tools. Therefore, in summit, focus on geopolitical environment, fragmentation versus integration, topics, mainstreaming of digital in the traditional policy issues, and third, uh, question of metaverse, hybrid meetings, and uh, artificial intelligence. Let's stay on the GPT recent development. I'm not quite sure... It existed when you met in Malta in November. So I'm not quite sure whether that was a topic on the agenda during the summit. But um, you had recently a discussion at the Diplo on this, among other tools. So what do you see? Because this is interesting. It's now fresh and uh, very relevant to our discussion in this podcast. GPT is an application of a trend that is technologically 
possible, achievable. What makes you see as an expert in digital diplomacy in the future? How, how does it play in the developments that you've been discussing now on the podcast? Uh, first, uh, the, this technology we've been following for the last five years, this Transformers technology, it became popular with ChatGPT, but OpenAI, GPT-2 and 3 were for quite some time around. And we, we developed a few applications around it. But what was useful, it suddenly came into the focus. People are discussing it, impact on education, impact on the white colors uh, professions. And uh, we said, okay, let's now use this opportunity to discuss seriously what will be impact on diplomacy. What is our conclusion in, from this, this discussion is that uh, the impact will be profound because the system, even if it is not ready today, through reinforced learning, it will become ready in the matter of one or two years. Therefore, there will be need for new type of skills. One skill is a so-called prompting what do we ask AI and how do we ask questions? In a way, getting back to all Socratic discussions when the key was to ask good question. Therefore, sometimes we are revisiting all philosophical concepts. Therefore, this is the first impact on prompting. Therefore, future diplomats and existing career diplomats will have to learn how to communicate with AI. Second point, which was interesting, is that most of AI systems generate new language without attribution. And in diplomacy, it's not only important what do you say, but who is behind certain st statement. Therefore, that nuance in the signaling, for example, through the documents, through the reports will remain human domain and garden that we have to cultivate. But the changes will be profound in the way how diplomats, what do they do? New skills will be, will be needed and uh, hopefully there will be impact to more clarity of discussion, more evidence-based uh, 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 negotiation and then leaving to diplomats what they have to do as representatives of human species and countries worldwide to sit around the table to negotiate and to reach the compromise and avoid conflicts. Therefore, that will be more important part, but probably for less diplomats than we have today. Therefore, machinery of reporting uh, will be reduced, but like in any impact of AI, there will be more focus on the on the that niche of, let's say, negotiating. That's That's came out of our discussion as one important message. Very interesting. Now, let's try and take um, a different angle to the same discussion, the angle of uh, digital governance and the future of multilateralism. We discuss a lot of the future about the future of multilateralism in this podcast, as you may know. But when we look at um, digital governance and the future of multilateralism, those two are linked. And just the, just the example you just gave now shows uh, how the, 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 linkage, the linkage is, is, is strong there. Uh, when we talk about governance, what is the state of play in digital governance? What are the main issues on the table? You discussed about the fragmentation um, scenario and the common good. That is, of course, one of the things that we have seen on the table for, for a while, the, the internet as a common good. But the governance aspect, how does it come into play and what is the state of play now? The state of play is related to a very simple question. Whom you or I should call if, for example, this podcast is uh, removed from the internet? It won't be. I'm not providing controversial issues. Or if... Uh, it's happened to a friend of mine. You start YouTube business and suddenly YouTube delink you. Or if you are attacked uh, with ransomware attack. For many of these issues, currently governments worldwide cannot deliver on their part of social contract. Social contract is very simple. We pay taxes. Some countries serve military service, uh, whatever is our duty. In exchange, we have protection from anarchy and security good functioning economy and the right to impact political life uh, through, through in many countries, through democracy. Governments cannot deliver on that today. Even well-functioning uh, governments and the legal system, we are facing a serious break of the overall digital, but also over, overall social contract. Now, digital governance and multilateral negotiations, because of the nature of digital technology, have to provide that place or places where citizens, companies and countries can f uh, answer their digital questions, digital policy questions. This is a very simple challenge, let's say, in, in brief. Now, how to achieve that? There have been many attempts. We have an excellent organization like, let's say, International Telecommunication Union here in Geneva, quite a few organizations which are trying to provide that answer. But still, because of the trans, uh, let's say, transborder nature of the digital technology and impact, uh, let's say, data impacts, uh, e-commerce, human rights, standardization, 
that's very difficult to answer from one angle. Therefore, there is now discussion in context of digital global com- uh, compact led by uh, Indian Ambassador Amandeep uh, Gill, who are trying to put various things together and to at least uh, have understanding uh, what is the current situation and what is the sort of level of complexity. And if it is possible, find these places especially for small and developing countries, where they can go and address their digital problems, from cybersecurity to e-commerce to other, other issues. Therefore, that's the, unfortunately, the situation is not very promising. Fortunately, internet is still robust. It functions. One thing that we should keep in mind, even in the case of the major conflicts, like what we are ex- uh, uh, experiencing these days in Ukraine, still there is, a pos- there is internet communication between, between two countries. Uh, many other inter- interlinked uh, uh, systems are broken, financial uh, uh, transfer, but people can send email and can communicate online. There was this situation, still robust structure, but many issues that can can shake the uh, global internet and the need to find these places on national, regional and global level to address the questions of citizens, companies and countries about digital issues. As we talk about the sort of global nature of the internet and, and, and everything digital, um, I came across your publication online, Digital Atlas. This, I think it's uh, quite a groundbreaking uh, um, adventure of uh, the Geneva Digital Platform, if I'm not mistaken, but I remember the Atlas very well. And I would like you to share with our audience a little bit of what it is and what it does and where to find it, because I found it fascinating. Atlas answers a few questions again. We try always to ask questions like like, uh, like this. We ask, for example, why Geneva plays an important role in digital governance? And we came to the concept which we uh, coined the Esprit Tech de Genève. You're familiar with Esprit de Genève? Esprit Tech de Genève. And in this analysis, we found that some thinking, philosophical, conceptual roots of the current uh, time could be found from um, Calvin, uh, Borges, uh, Mary Shelley, who who wrote uh, Frankenstein, uh, many other thinkers who basically laid the basis for the um, understanding this interplay or meeting between technology and society. This is ultimately what Geneva is and was and most likely will be. How to manage this meeting and interplay between technology and society? In the past, it was telegraph, telephone. Uh, today is digital digital technology. Then what we did, we analyzed uh, activities of all Geneva-based actors and identified their coverage of issues, cybersecurity, data, artificial intelligence, and uh, and uh, other issues. That's, that's quite voluminous uh, uh, the development. But while we were preparing Atlas, we realized that uh, almost when we sent to print, it became obsolete uh, in a matter of two weeks. Therefore, we invented the new method of uh, following and updating Atlas through the use of AI. Let's say if ITU has a major event on cybersecurity, we have Atlas coverage on IT and cybersecurity, but then our AI crawler will go analyze and add that line to the coverage of IT and cybersecurity. Therefore, it's also a new type of publication which starts from the past, historical roots of Esprit Tech de Genève, but basically I codify the current moment, but also looking towards the future, what we can do in Geneva to negotiate this, what digital governance, social contract, uh, which is a major challenge ahead of us. So would you say, so first I should understand that the Atlas is not a global look at digital, is Geneva, is your observation area, international Geneva. Then I have a question about that. Geneva includes the majority of UN family specialized agencies and a good part of the secretariat, of course. How heavy are they in the digital world? How heavy? Well, they're moving. uh, You have traditionally the oldest organization, International Telecommunication Union, but you have a a human rights uh, organization, humanitarian WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization, World Trade Organization, they have been moving quite fast in this field. What is Geneva's uniqueness comparing to other multilateral capitals when it comes to digital technology? Member states, by following ITU, 
and World Summit on Information Society and Internet Governance Forum developed capacities to follow digital issues. This capacity is lacking in other international centers. We are now following developments in New York and you don't have that advanced uh, expertise within permanent emissions of especially small and developing countries. That's, that's important. Therefore, I would say that the tempo has accelerated driven by demand on to address issues of digital health or e-commerce and other other issues organizations are adjusting on the as as they're moving ahead permanent missions are adjusting that outer limit of think tanks academia is also moving fast therefore there is one important uh, dynamism but one ha- what we have to keep in mind, Geneva is important, probably the, the leading center when it comes to the global coverage. But you have other centers. You have Vienna with a heavy focus on cybercrime, for example. You have Brussels, which is probably the capitals of hard digital power. Because you can just follow where the private companies, Google and the others, have the biggest offices. They have the, one of the biggest lobbying offices in Brussels. Because what is negotiated in Brussels is carefully followed by countries worldwide. GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, has been now copied worldwide. Therefore, the companies are aware that when they negotiate with the European Union, which has a cloud to negotiate as equal partner, they in a way negotiate with the rest of the world. We are now discussing how to make these dynamics with, the, with the Brussels more effective and with Paris, where you have UNESCO, OECD and other actors. And that's, that's I would say, wider global ecosystem where Geneva play an important role, but other centers are equally important in, let's say, soft, both soft and hard digital politics. Now I'd like to ask you um, a difficult question because I imagine our audience, as many diplomats I've met um, in, 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 the, in recent years, have this question of what does the future of technology hold for diplomacy? So as we measure the current impact of the technology we already have on diplomacy, and you made a few quite interesting and telling examples during our conversation, what should we imagine that technology will bring in the future to diplomacy and how would that impact what we call diplomacy, the way we understand diplomacy today? There will be a need for more diplomacy because the world will become increasingly interdependent because of digitalization, but it doesn't mean that that diplomacy will be always performed by traditional diplomats. There will most likely more diplomacy and less traditional diplomacy. What will remain are the core elements of diplomacy since very early days when our far predecessor jumped in the Serengeti somewhere in Tanzania and started running and realized that it was better to uh, hear the other side and negotiate than to fight. That's the route. That will remain more or less the same. Therefore, diplomats or diplomats, new type of diplomats, will represent countries, but also communities, also companies and other interests. They will negotiate and they will try to solve the conflicts. Therefore, that will remain the same, but the architecture of the global system and global negotiation will change, and the skills, skill set that will be needed by diplomats will change, I would say, faster than uh, than I thought 10 years ago, for example. So you can see the acceleration. One of the things that uh, was apparent in ma- through many studies is that actually the diplomacy as a discipline was the least affected professional category by technology. If you speak to a medical doctor, he will tell you that in the arc of his profession, almost everything has changed and almost every tool has been improved by technology. Same for the the transportation industry or many other industries, the the entertainment industry, uh, even lawyers can tell you about that. And diplomats were sort of immune uh, just up to very recently. And so you now see this acceleration. So that is is that to say that diplomats should be bracing now for a sort of uh, being transported into uh, ultra technological future much more rapidly than their colleagues in the medical field, for example? Not necessarily, but let me tell you one anecdote from uh, Hemingway when he got bankrupt. They asked him uh, how he got bankrupt, and he said in uh, two ways uh, gradually and suddenly. Changes come uh, gradually, and if you 
analyze the daily routines of diplomats, they have changed. With use of word processing, with use of online meetings, and diplomacy, uh, although it's very often considered as a conservative profession, adjusted very well, for example, during COVID time, to use online meetings Zoom. Now, we shouldn't uh, underestimate adaptability of the diplomatic profession. What is going to change, definitely, is uh, the less relevance of diplomatic machinery. That will be uh, increasingly automated, like diplomatic reporting, which we already mentioned. But niche, which diplomats will always preserve, is related to representation and negotiation. That, in my view, will remain exclusive niche for humans. Machines won't get there easily. Because you need buy-in when you negotiate with the other side. You need commitment, you need body language, you need uh, reassurance. Difficult deals cannot be negotiated online, as uh, we've been seeing. That will remain the niche. Therefore, diplomacy as machinery will substantively um, change, including uh, international Geneva and multilateral diplomacy. Diplomacy as representation and negotiation will remain exclusive, let's say, professional garden of uh, humans, uh, human diplomats. I think this is a good point to start wrapping up our, our conversation. So I would like to ask you, I always ask our guests, if, if our audience were to retain one concept, one main line from, from this conversation, what would be your final thought to imprint in their brains? from your point of view, on the rise of digital diplomacy? Use common sense, understand the history and core humanity in order to predict uh, use of technology. Some concepts will remain the same. For example, the fact that uh, might could be a right and could lead to fight existed 10 centuries ago, exists today, and it, it will exist in the future. Avoid the chrono narcissism that think you think that everything is happening today, things happened before us, will happen after us. A bit of humility of us as a generation is important in uh, understanding, I would say this pivotal moment in the history where some of core elements of humanity are challenged, from free will to our autonomy to our exclusivity to be creative and thinking machine. That's Del delicate moment and diplomacy will play an important role in navigating us with humility, with understanding of history through this, through these changes ahead of us. I'm glad I asked you the question. This is a, this is a very powerful final thought. Thank you for that. Where can our audience find more about Diplo, Diplo Foundation, the other platforms you lead, and your own work as an expert? Web resources. We'll put some links in our yeah. in our in our notes to this chat, of course. But uh, this is the time maybe to point them to simply the Diplo or the Geneva Internet Platform uh, URLs. Sure, that's uh, www.diplomacy.edu. Dig.watch, very simple, for Digital Watch. Those are two main, I would say, resources. But also, join us for some activities. We have an interesting discussion in the Jardin Botanique, where we walk through the garden and we discuss parallel between nature and artificial intelligence, just as one example. And that's uh, another activity which we cannot uh, easily replicate online, but colleagues and friends who are in Geneva can join us for some activities where we try to walk digital governance, AI governance, and future of digitalization. Wonderful idea. Well, Jovan Kurbalier, Executive Director of the Diplo Foundation, thank you so much for taking the time to be on our podcast today. Thank you, Francesco. It was a really great pleasure.